Hello everyone, my name is Bing Ouyang. I'm a material scientist working on the field of computational material science and autonomous synthesis. This is my channel for sharing my understanding of material science. I will post either my understanding of a paper, some mini tutorials of material science, as well as some funny things as a material scientist. Please subscribe if you want to get up-to-date information from me. Today, I'd like to share with you guys about my understanding of density functional theory calculations using VASP. Density functional theory is also called DFT. It's a theory to model the electronic states of uh, materials. And VASP is actually the most popular software for doing DFT calculations, especially for solid materials. So today, in this video, I'd like to give you a brief tour about how to do DFT calculations using WASP and what exactly is DFT calculations. All right, let's get started. So a brief introduction about what can we do by using WASP and by running DFT calculations. There are basically three types of it, which covers energetic calculations, dynamic calculations, as well as electronic calculations. Energetic calculations basically coming from the total energy of a system. So we can use that to estimate properties such as phase stability, phase, and we can also use that to construct phase diagrams. And at the same time, we can do a slightly different version of comparing the uh, energetic by constructing this so-called voltage curve. It's basically uh, used uh, in uh, the energy materials, especially for secondary batteries. And we can also use energy comparisons to predict the most stable structures, the most stable defects, as well as the best configurations for a surface and interface. On the other hand, we also can use that for dynamic calculations compared with the static calculations, which is the total energy calculations. So in dynamic calculations, we can use that to estimate something like an activation barrier of the dynamic process. Or we can do molecular dynamics to simulate the whole dynamic process. And in the other hand, we can also do something like lattice dynamics, which we use that to estimate the lattice vibration properties. And when it comes to electronic structures, this is something rather unique for those quantum scale calculations because it basically starts from electrons. So in that case, by solving a certain equations, which I'm going to introduce in the next slide, you're going to get the states of electrons. With such a result, you will be able to model things like how different electrons form chemical bond in the solid, and what is the electronic state of the materials. So you can estimate it things like density of states or band structure. At the same time, if you're working on the field of chemical reactions or like energy materials like me, then you probably need that to estimate the redox reactions and the redox behaviors of certain materials. And if you are working on functional materials, you probably need, also need that to estimate things like polarization, magnetism, and things like that. And if you are dealing with optical properties, DFT calculation can also help you to estimate the electronic citation state. So those basically covers most of the properties you're going to discuss when you are dealing with the new materials or when you are trying to optimize the certain materials. So what is density functional theory? Density functional theory is basically a way to solve the Schrodinger's equation. We all know that in the solid, the number of electrons are always way larger than the number of electrons. So if you want to solve the Schrodinger's equations with 
a distinct large amount of electrons, it, it can easily scale up and no one can really solve it, even with supercomputers. So in that case, we really need some theory to simplify this mathematic model. And we need some estimations. So density functional theory is basically a way to simplify the solving process of the Schrodinger's equation. So we can decompose the total energy of the materials into different pieces, which covers the first two terms, which are the electron-electron interaction energies, which involves the kinetic energy, the Hartree energy, which is basically the repulsion between electrons, as well as the exchange correlation energy, and the potential energy. So a summation of those energy can end up with the total energy of the system. And each single energy is a function of electron density. At the same time, the electron density is a function of a specific special space in the solid. So this is how it obtains the name of a density functional theory, because it comes from the density of electrons, and we are using this electron density functionals to model the Hamiltonian of the system. So one thing you want to keep in mind, which is related, and you're going to always see terminology such as LDA, GGA, meta GGA, or hybrid functionals. Those are basically different ways to estimate the third part of this uh, energy decomposition, which is exchange correlation functionals. So this term is actually the most difficult part to be estimated. So the development of the DFT theory is always driven by a new method or a new model that can capture a more accurate value of this term. All right, so when it comes to VASP package, the full name is actually Vienna AB Initial Simulation Package. So some basic feature of WASP is like, first of all, it's the most popular software, especially when you're trying to model uh, the electronic structure of a solid. At the same time, it's a plain wave basis set, which indicates that they will artificially add the periodic boundary conditions. In other words, it works better for those bulk systems, which have these periodic boundary conditions. And secondly, it used pseudo potentials to speed up the overall numeric solutions. The reason for that is because it, it takes the assumption that the inner electron state will not be influenced by whatever structures they are trying to form. They are basically inert electrons. Based on these assumptions, you can actually pre-calculate the electronic states of those inner electrons. In that case, it's going to save you a lot of calculation effort because what you're trying to solve on the fly would only be the valence electron of the solid. And the third thing you want to know about the FTs, uh, about VASP, is that it covers most of the features you can find in any other DFT code. So it has a com comprehensive implementation of the DFT features for solids. And at the same time, there are also something that VASP is not very good at. For instance, if you want to do DFT in very large scale, uh, it's not impossible. So, but you probably don't want to do that with VASP. There are a lot of reasons about it, which involves like the prime wave basis sets, and you probably need some higher level uh, approximation and a simpler model to speed up uh, the 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 numeric uh, the numeric process, and at the same time because it adds artificial uh, uh, periodic boundary conditions, which works perfect for uh, bulk materials, but it doesn't really work so well for things like polymers, atomic clusters, and non-periodic structures because in that case you are adding something artificial, and it is not. It doesn't really work so well if you want to do like long-time molecular dynamic simulations 
For instance, if you want to do MD simulations uh, with uh, the time scale longer than one nanoseconds, so this is really very challenging for the uh, for uh, for VASP. And at the same time, if you want to model some defects with long range interactions, such as dislocation, a crack, and uh, green boundaries, it's not uh, so good to use DFT. You probably are looking for something like a force field, and so that you can do a larger scale molecular dynamic simulations. So those are basically the pros and cons of using VASP. So how do we use VASP? So in the latest slide, I'm just trying to show you the basic format of the input files for VASP calculations. So what you need to do is actually to prepare four input files and then just run VASP. It's going to give you a series of output files which covers pretty much every basic properties of a solid. So the first file you're going to need is called postcard. It's basically the atomic structures of the materials you are interested in. So it starts with some comment line, which here is the postcard example, and followed by uh, four lines. Well, the first line is usually 1.0, or the lattice constant. And the second um, the, the second to the fourth line are basically the base vectors of the simulation box. Usually, we use the base vectors of a primitive cell times the supercell matrix. And then it's followed by the definition of the different species in the postcard. And then you can give other parameters, such as if you want to fix certain atoms in the, in, in the structures. If you want to do that, then you need to do selective dynamics. Otherwise, you just go with all these lines. And then you need to tell that uh, whether your coordination system is a direct coordination system or the Cartesian coordination system. A direct coordination system basically uses fractional coordinates. So the real coordinates is the coordinate you see times the base vectors, which is a matrix I, I explain from the third line to the fifth line. And if it's a Cartesian coordinates, then it's basically the real coordinates of each of the atoms. And in some of the occasions, you're going to also see numbers after all, all the position of the atoms. That is very frequent to be seen in molecular dynamics. Those are basically the velocity of each of the atoms. So that's pretty much all the information you want to have in the postcard. And then, after setting up the atomic structures, you also want to set up some calculation parameters, right? So, because we are just running VASP as a solver of uh, the simplified Schrodinger's equation, which is a cohen sherman equation. So in that case, we need to set up how do we do this kind of pneumonic uh, convergency, right? So in that case, it basically involves several steps. So first of all, it will do electronic structure optimization so that it's going to converge the electron density of the materials into a minimum state uh, or a minimum energy state. So those are the parameters that you can use to play with the convergency of the electronic step. So after you reach the local minimum of the electronic state, you're also going to try to run ionic step, which in that case, you are trying to displace the atoms in the simulation cells so to a lower energy state so that finally you can get a relaxed structures while all the atoms stay at the site that have lowest energy. So in that case, there are a lot of parameters to tune, for instance, like the magnitude of the displacement how many displacement you're going to try, as well as some convergency criterion by doing this ionic relaxation. And then we have some controlling of how to solve the equation, for instance, how to control the precisions. So how to decide when the calculation is converged, as well as how to prioritize the solving of these equations, 
how to output different files, which is IO control, as well as how to initialize and establish the magnetism and the polarization of the system. Whether we need some specific corrections of the system, for instance, like DFT plus U, and whether we are doing uh, AIMD calculations, which is AB initial molecular dynamics simulations. And if you are doing activation barrier calculations, you also want to play with the parameters which are related to the NEB process. So those are the basic parameters that you're going to use in an uh, in-car. And uh, you don't, actually, you don't need to memorize the usage of all those parameters when you want to use it and when you want to change the value of it, you can actually always Google um, the, the tag of each of the parameters and you will find actually, you know, like what does it mean and how to adjust the, the value of these parameters. So the third thing you need to do is actually how to do the sampling. So when we solve the Schrodinger's equation, it's very frequently that we're trying to solve it in the reciprocal space. So you also need to tell the code how to sample the reciprocal space. So the K points basically tells the code how to sample in the Boolean law. There are basically different versions of sampling the K points. So which involves either like a fully autom automatic sampling, a line mode, or in the manual mode. And you want to be careful about, uh, in different systems, you probably need a different ways of sampling the k-points. For instance, in metals, you probably need more k-points. And also, you probably want the convergence test of the best amount of k-points for a specific system. And a larger number of k-points will always guarantee a better accuracy, but it also sacrifices efficiency. And as I just mentioned, DFT, uh, especially uh, DFT calculations in VASP, would use actually shooter potentials to reduce the calculation amount. So the shooter potential actually pre-calculated electronic state of the inner shell electrons. So there are basically different versions of the port cars depending on how you define the inner shell electrons, right? So in that case, there will be different version of the shooter potentials. So you probably want to make a selection of the different sh shooter potentials before you're running into a production calculations. So that's pretty much of the input file you need for uh, doing a DFT calculations using VASP. Then a general workflow of DFT calculation is going to involve the input atomic structures. And then, as I just mentioned, you're going to do a self-consistent iteration for the lowest energy electronic state, given the locations of each atoms. And after this self-consistent iterations, the code is going to check the force between different atoms. So if there's a large force between certain atoms, it indicates that the atom prefer to move. It it either like get attracted with each other or get repulsed with each other. So in that case, it will uh, follow this uh, electronic iteration with ionic iterations so that you can get the lowest energy atomic configurations. So with this kind of a loop, finally, you're going to converge into some low energy state, right? So in that case, it's going to dump the material basic properties that you are looking for, such as the energies, the best atomic structures, which involves the lowest energy location of each atoms. And at the same time, you can also get information about the electronic state, such as uh, the density states, the eigenvalues of all the electrons in the brilliant zone, as well as the wave functions, the charge density, etc. So there's another way that you can run this code, which is starting from some electronic structure files, such as wave car and charge car, and you can do a non-self-consistent iterations. In such kind of iterations, you're going to fix the electronic states. 
And then you do a superposition of electronic state by basically scaling up the input files, uh, which is the input electron state, to a new system. So this has been used when you're trying to transfer the calculation result to a much larger supercell or more accurate or more denser sampling of the brilliant ball. So that's the basic ways we are trying to use the DFT and this is pretty much about the numeric workflows. So the next question is like, what are you gonna get from uh, VASP calculations, right? So you're gonna get a variety of output files. It's roughly like tens of files. So you probably want to know what are the informations you want to extract from these output files. It covers something like energy and atomic informations. For instance, like count car will give you the atomic configuration from the last ionic step, which is usually the lowest energy atomic configurations. And if you're doing a molecular dynamic system, um, you probably want to look at also the X state car, which gives you the atomic configurations in each of the ionic step or in certain ionic step. And there are other things related to the atomic configuration, such as PC data car, that gives you the power correlation function. And also, if you want to keep track of the evolution of the energetics, you can refer to the Aussie car. And for electronic informations, you can get density of state from those car, and you can get eigenvalues, um, which is basically the electronic state in your sample debris zone from eigenvalue car. And you can get electron density, local potential, as well as the electron localization function from charge car, local pot, and ELF car. And you can get electron wave functions from the wave guide file. So at the same time, you can get two other files that give you a summary of most of the details of the calculations. Like the first one is old car, which contains most of the log information about calculations and the main output results. And the wasprong.xml files also have a collection of the most of the calculation output, which covers things like energetics, density of states, uh, sometimes like the Egan values as well as the charge densities. So those will be the most informative files in all of the outputs. So in the next workshop, I will basically show you some convenient ways to using ex existing packages to process those files. Otherwise, you probably need to code yourself um, to process uh, those kind of files because this only have the raw data. So you really need to uh, report the data from this, uh, this, this original files into something uh, that have a better shape and format. So we have some existing code, for instance, like a Panagen, or you can write a simple uh, Python code to, to deal with it. So I will cover that in my next uh, uh, slides. And some uh, some other details about the FT calculations is if you are modeling a transition metal, so for a lot of the times you want to add a Huber like U so that you can capture the electron localization in the species with D and F electrons. Here I give example that by adding um, DFT plus U, it actually gives a better capture of the lithium intercalation uh, potentials, uh, which is essentially the lithium voltage, if you're dealing with the lithium ion battery or lithium related batteries. So in that case, one thing you want to consider is how to benchmark and select the best Huber U parameters when you are dealing with a transition metal species. This will also be covered by latest uh, uh, videos. Uh, from, from my channel. And currently, we actually have a new feature, which is actually better than GJ plus U. And GJ plus U is actually some kind of old style things which has been used for quite a long time. And recently, we have this so-called scan. It's actually a cheap version of a metal GJ, 
which is a higher standard of functionals compiled with a typical GGA. By using scan, you can actually have a more accurate description of formation energy. So here I give two examples. If you want to calculate the binary formation energy from the elemental phases, the scan will always captures the right or with very small arrows about the formation energy of a sulfide or oxide, but PBE, which is one type of a GGA functionals, always have a systematic arrows if you compile that with experiments. And at the same time, it's much faster than other high-level methods, uh, such as metal GGA or hyper GGA method. So in that case, scan will always be a good choice if you realize that the GGA or GGA plus U cannot really give you a consistent result with experimental observations. So there are also different versions of VASP, which is gamma center only version, the non colonial version, as well as a VASP patched with the transition state tools. Uh, the transition state tools are basically developed by a third party, which is the Hankerman School in University of Texas, Austin. And also, if you want to use VAS with advanced MD techniques, and you, you probably want to start with VAS later than 5.4, then in that case, by default, they will have these advanced MD modules. And if you want to automate a DFD calculations, you probably want to use some automators or some pre-processing code that are available. There are really a lot of codes in this field. So in the next video, I'd like to give you a brief introduction about one of the most popular codes that we're using. It's also one of my favorite package for doing DFD calculations is the PyMyGen. So I will give you a brief tour about PyMyGen in the coming new video. So that's pretty much about uh, a brief introduction about DFT calculations and the VASP. Thank you again for your attentions. I will see you in my next video.